Former Fox News host Tucker Carlson interviewed Russian President Vladimir Putin. Thus far, the interview has over 193 million views on X alone, formerly Twitter, plus tens of millions of uh, views on his shorter clips that are circulating online. During the two-hour chat, they discuss the war in Ukraine, NATO expansion and the imprisonment of an American journalist. Joining me now to discuss is research analyst at the Centre for Naval Analysis, Julian Waller. Julian, thank you so much for your time. What was your main takeaway from the interview? Thank you, Rita. Very happy to be here. Um, what I would say, this interview is, is unique. It's unusual in many respects. Uh, and most of all, uh, it provided very, very good introduction to Vladimir Putin's unique historical obsessions. He spent for half an hour uh, mm. talking about ancient to medieval to modern history uh, as part of a broader claim, a territorial claim, a claim of sovereignty uh, on and over uh, Ukraine itself. Uh, this is not a new uh, point for Vladimir Putin the last several years. If you are a Russian, if you live in Russia, you hear this from him fairly often. He will go on these historical tangents. Uh, but what is what is new is that we're we're hearing this in the sort of Anglo-American sphere uh, for the first time with, with such a wide and broad audience, and it also adds uh, some nuances to how we think about the causes of the war itself. That there's very much so a personal component to it that uh, Mr. Putin obsesses over. Well, it's apparent that the history of the region is just critically important to Putin. He mentioned he spoke about it for half an hour and he would not be deviated from it. He was, he was going to give that history lesson. Is this just a justification for his invasion of Ukraine or is it the real motivating factor behind the invasion? So this is a major question uh, that we have among international relations scholars, policymakers, and just people generally observing the conflict. What causes the war? Uh, what's the ultimate motivation vis-a-vis uh, -vis various mm. uh, casus belli, right? So there's a lot of uh, mm. different arguments for why the war started, and there's several arguments that the Russian state, the Russian government, have put forward, right? We've heard about NATO expansion. We've heard about protecting Russian speakers in southeastern Ukraine. We've heard about denazification, so-called. Uh, we've heard about all of these varying reasons and justifications or legitimating strategies uh, for the war, why uh, why the war was uh, going on. Uh, when the war began, Vladimir Putin, uh, in his announcements to various Russian institutions, he, he specified sort of protection of the uh, two so-called people's republics, uh, the separatist regions in Ukraine at the time. Um, However, what's important here is we have sort of surface level justifications, which certainly may have important degrees of rhetorical truth uh, from the Russian perspective. And then there's sort of the actual hard causal argument, right? What really motivated mm. Russia and the autocrat of Russia, Vladimir Putin, to decide in February of 2022? And that's a major question. That's not the same thing as just saying here are a variety of reasons because many of these reasons have existed for a long time. NATO expansion has been a perennial uh, point of contention between Russia and the West, right? Mm. Putin himself, in his remarks to Tucker, uh, talk about talks about this at length, right? It's not like NATO expansion uh, doesn't matter in the broader rhetorical strategy or in perhaps some degree of threat perception. But if that's the case, why in 2022, as opposed to 2019, or 2015, or 2014, or 2008, so on and so forth, right? So we need to, given that that variable doesn't really change, we have to understand a little bit more. And what this particular performance by the Russian president suggests is that there is a personal motivation, a deep interest in history that's been uh, jump-started in recent years. We have, this is another data point to suggest that this obsession is personal and deep. Uh, we also have the very, very important uh, essay that Vladimir Putin himself wrote uh, just about a half a year before the invasion itself in summer of 2021 on the historical unity of Russians and Ukrainians, uh, which goes through many of the same points. We know uh, through Russian channels mm -hmm. that during the COVID uh, pandemic, he's an older man. He had a germophobic tendency. He isolated himself during this time. Not only did he isolate himself with close friends, 
that had fairly extreme or more hardcore views on Ukraine. Uh, but he also took time in isolation to order uh, evidence from archives, from the Russian state archives, for him to pour over, uh, which helped him indeed write, uh, or at least partially write, a history essay, which he then published uh, in a Russian newspaper for the entire country to see. At the time, we thought it was kind of silly, a little bit of an eccentricity. It turns mm -hmm. out that essay might, in fact, be one of the more important documents in terms of understanding the actual motivations and triggers of a major world leader who will, in due course, precipitate a major territorial war. Now, you mentioned NATO expansion. Uh... If we had a second Trump term, given his attitude to to NATO, how do you think uh, that conflict is going to play out? What would a Trump presidency do to the Russian-Ukraine conflict? The question is a little bit difficult because the first Trump term compared to a hypothetical second Trump term is potentially quite distinct. Mm. Trump has always talked in a very sort of materialistic and quid pro quo uh, way about NATO. Uh, he doesn't particularly mm. like it, at least in our estimation. Uh, he is constantly talking about the need for uh, other European and other allied uh, states to pay up, even though that's not quite how the NATO structure works. But nevertheless, uh, one can view that as a, a form of pressure. And, and to some degree, it did work mm. from 2017 to 2020. Uh, we don't want to read too much into that in terms of intentionality. Uh, but European powers did begin to see that they couldn't solely rely on the U.S. during that time. The other point that we have to keep in mind is what didn't happen. The United States did not withdraw from NATO. Uh, the United States did not renege on its mm. Article 5 uh, guarantee, exactly. uh, which is the cornerstone of the alliance. So that's the first Trump term. A, a new Trump term might be a little bit different, right? This is now several years later. Uh, Mr. Trump uh, has gotten even more uh, vociferous and vehement about his distaste uh, for NATO. In, any, in many ways, his rhetoric is more radical than it was in the past. So it's unclear if the fact that the t ultimate outcome uh, did not match his rhetoric in his first term whether that will remain the case in a second term. It's very, very difficult to predict that. Now, in the interview, Tucker Carlson also brought up the plight of Wall Street Journal journalist Evan Gershowitz. Let's have a look at that exchange. What makes, <clears throat> and it's not my business, but what makes this difference is the guy's obviously not a spy, he's a kid. And maybe he was breaking your law in some way, but he's not a super spy and everybody knows that. And he's being held hostage in exchange, which is true. With respect, it's true and everyone knows it's true. So maybe he's in a different category. Maybe it's not fair to ask for you know, somebody else in exchange for letting him out. Maybe it degrades Russia to do that. I don't know who he was working for, but I would like to reiterate that getting classified information in secret is called espionage. And he was working for the US Special Services, some other agencies. What did you make of his response? The full exchange went for about five minutes and uh, Tucker Carlson called Evan a hostage. Uh, that was bold of him. Uh, Putin has perhaps killed people for less. Uh, will that help to get Evan home or is that going to make it even more difficult? It's difficult to say if the Tucker's intervention will make a strong difference. Uh, it, it was uh, bold of him to do so. Um, he uh, mm. Tucker came under a lot of criticism for holding this uh, interview at all, right? Uh, he even mentioned uh, wondering whether he'll be branded a traitor uh, because of it. Uh, so as a result, he's in sort of a unique opportunity to make uh, Putin slightly uncomfortable with this question. Um, so in this sense, Tucker did, did quite right against what is obviously an American political prisoner and a journalistic prisoner at that. Um, now, there are, of course, uh, informal discussions that Putin in the broader discussion alluded to uh, between the U.S. And, and, and Russia in terms of a prisoner exchange. Uh, will this make it harder? It is unlikely to be the case. Uh, Vladimir Putin yes. was very likely informed ahead of time if they hadn't already even agreed to it. Uh, that this would be discussed. And in fact, uh, Putin's answer suggest, suggested that he had sort of a pat response. Mm. 
Mm. Well, let's just hope uh, Evan is back home because, uh, like his Tracker Carlson said, it degrades Russia to, to treat him like a spy and have a prison exchange when really it was an opportunistic uh, hostage taking exercise. Julian Waller, thank you so much for your time and insights. Really do appreciate it. Thank you very much. It was a great pleasure to be on.